Well, I don't really know how to start this, truth be told. Uh, but I figured, you know, I get a lot of questions usually after I go on different trips or do different things sometimes about the place, about the process, um, and kind of just about the whole experience. So I kind of figured it would be fun if we uh, if we go through a little behind the scenes or maybe kind of a, a recap or how to about these different places. So I figure every time I'll go on a camping trip or make a camping video, I'll probably do some sort of a BTS or kind of what to look out for, what was special about this place um, to be able to kind of you know, just recap and kind of share my experience or kind of talk about some different things that, that you may encounter or that were surprising to me along the way. Uh, so I wrote out a little list of things I wanted to touch on, and I'll also include some some behind the scenes or photos that I took as well along, uh, along for the ride here. So we'll just dive right in. We'll kind of make it kind of a one take. Um, I might might do a few cuts here and there, but Really, I want to make this seem a little bit more kind of raw, if that makes sense. So you can see my computer. I'm recording my audio right now. But I do have some things I want to touch on that are on a separate program that we'll go into a little bit later. So uh, the first kind of thing is with this, this kind of video category that we're doing here, uh, I, I got into this, um, especially when the quarantine started. Uh, there's a guy named Craig Adams that I like to watch a lot. He does a lot of kind of minimalist backpacking videos that are really just kind of silent ambient films. And I started watching that uh, before I would go to bed in the evening sometimes. It's like a nice kind of peaceful way to wind down the day. Um, and, you know, especially with... Uh, the kind of editing or videos that I do for a lot of people, um, they're a lot more kind of fast paced or especially more so gym edits that I've done a lot in the past few years. A lot more of them are more fast paced and uh, kind of, you know, jump cutty um, to where they have a lot of transitions or it's very kind of some sort of high, I don't know, high intensity song. So with a lot of this stuff, I... I do kind of miss, there's something that I love about movies, there's something that I love about more so creative works that I feel like I'm drawn to because there's a good sense of pacing about it. There's a nice kind of, I don't know, there's like a pause, there's an intention. I love watching things like Planet Earth or sometimes old film movies, um, Maybe Fantasia is like another example, but you know, there's something about, I feel like, so, uh, that kind of work brings you in, I feel like in a certain way that, you know, when, when something's not happening in every frame or every shot of the video, you get a little bit of a pause that you're able to kind of take in a little bit more of the surroundings, the color, the sound, kind of how the the sound matches with the music of the video, if that makes sense. And when I saw Craig's videos, that really kind of drew me in because there's something to be said. There's a lot of different content creators out there that whether they be travel video makers or vloggers or this or that, even photographer guys that I watch, there's a certain, I don't know, there's something to be desired because I feel like I'm more so drawn to the story of the experience versus you talking about it, if that makes sense. I like watching the journey. I don't really like having the whole vlog kind of need to to fill that space with talking if that makes sense i i would much rather observe and kind of take in and maybe come away from that with my own interpretation of how that feeling went versus like a vlog if that makes sense with vloggers i feel like there's this need to kind of always have something interesting something that you have to say your feelings about something if that makes sense versus just kind of letting the viewer interpret that how they will if that makes sense so for me i've never really been drawn to vlogging i've dabbled with it a few years back when i first started doing youtube and uh you know there's just like my life is a lot more slow paced i'm much more kind of meditative and i i do a lot of things day by day that i kind of just 
you know, I read, I, I do a lot of the kind of the same things every day and just kind of reflect on them, build on them, if that makes sense. I don't really do a lot of interesting things. And for me, the biggest kind of reason why I do not vlog is because I just don't feel like trying to almost fabricate or manufacture this interesting kind of new thing to kind of fill my day to day with, if that makes sense. I feel like a lot of vlogging is like, I don't know, clickbait to where I don't, you get my drift. You know, there's there's not something new that I feel like I need to bring to the table every time. I would rather almost present something that I've taken my time on that is much more intentional and that you can kind of come away from that with your own interpretation of, if that makes sense. And I've been thinking a lot about kind of the content that I want to create or or kind of cultivate in terms of I really love, I don't like to really consume things just to have something to watch. I don't really like having, you know, just something to kind of fill my time, if that makes sense, when it comes to things I like to listen to or watch. I really like to try to learn as much as I can or at least be inspired to do something. Um, so th I've been really thinking about, you know, like what do I feel like I can bring to the table in terms of my own content I'd like to make? So I've been thinking about, you know, I'd like to make some educational stuff in terms of fitness or nutrition with, with what I learn and kind of the journey that I go on in that regard. Um, but also there's a really big side of me that's that's grown in the past few years in terms of, I really just love to learn about kind of the fundamentals of of art, of composition, of color psychology, of of theory in that regard, as well as there's a big side of me as well that I've really learned how to kind of turn things off and kind of really work towards being more present. And that's what I love about a lot of these trips that I go on and why I'd like to start sharing more of that is because there's there's a great kind of balance or feeling to be had when you just turn things off and go on a trip and disconnect from everything and you're not kind of in that network that frame of you know constantly communicating seeing what the latest kind of outrage is or news is or someone's opinion is or other things like that there's something that's very grounding about turning it all off finding a destination going on your own journey and kind of coming away from that with whatever you've taken away from that, if that makes sense. That's something I love about going camping, going backpacking is, you know, even if it's just a day, two days, I do feel like I come away from that every time with something different, um, something I've learned or thought about. And I feel like there's something to be said too about, you know, going on a hike, on a walk, when you have some sort of repetitive motion or scenery changing, you can kind of let your mind wander and really unravel some things that you've been going with. So anyway, long story short, or short story long, uh, that's kind of why I wanted to start doing some more stuff like this and really just kind of sharing, you know, the feeling that I come away from with a lot of this stuff. So I'd like to maybe start planning some more trips and uh, really just kind of sharing that kind of more so creative flow, uh, meditative video, if that makes sense. Very woo-woo. So uh, anyway, that was the first point. And uh, I picked this place, you know, I've been really kind of looking a little bit more around Virginia. I can't really afford to go too many places out of state or out of country that a lot of people do. I know a lot of people go to Bali or Norway or this or that. And uh for me, I um, I don't know. I, I can't really afford that at the moment. So I've been trying to find some hidden gems around Virginia uh, because I've really only gone camping a handful of times. And that's really only been, you know, growing up as a kid in my backyard or kind of just some things here and there. And uh, I've really started to learn a little bit more about backpacking in the past year because I don't know. I was always intrigued about being able to just carry everything you need on your back. And with backpacking, a lot of supplies are very lightweight and essential. And growing up, we always had gone camping in like RV parks or uh, where you kind of bring your, 
I don't know, we would bring uh, our coolers or grills in a truck with my dad. And even though that was a little bit more rugged, it still just felt so hectic in terms of we had air mattresses and propane tanks and ice bags and this and that. And it just felt like such an ordeal to get all these big Rubbermaid containers out and sift through everything. So for me, backpacking was really like a little bit of an individual type thing that I could start to uh, learn a little bit more about. And it felt really, I don't know, just really nomadic, I guess, to be able to just carry everything on your back, um, kind of find where you want to settle down. And then uh, just kind of have all your supplies with you, if that makes sense. So you can just settle wherever you want to. You figure things out along the way. If you find a nice spot, you can settle there. It doesn't have to be somewhere that you have to drive and park to. So I've been really trying to look for some places around Virginia that I can start to experiment with for those. Um, And it's kind of been a little bit of a journey. Um, There have been a couple places I've gone to that... You know, it looks very majestic, uh, but when you actually get there, it might be four hours away, five hours away, and it turns out to be some sort of, you know, paved RV park where, you know, the uh, the grand vista, the grand view is like a hundred yards away from the parking lot. And that was really disappointing to me. So I've been trying to find maybe a little bit less state park and a little bit more like wilderness area and not backcountry per se, but a little bit more of a trail kind of uh, areas to go in. So I picked this place. Um, I had found some lists that I was combing through and a few uh, photo books that I've been looking at as far as different places in Appalachia or along the Appalachian Trail that are that are good to explore. And uh, I came across this one spot that looked like it would be really interesting. It was called Elk Garden, and it had went through Mount Rogers, which I've gone to Mount Rogers before, and I really like that. Um, but this was interesting to me because uh, Mount Rogers, if you want to do like a day or overnight hike, you have to go through Grayson Highlands usually, which is a state park. And they've changed that now to where you need reservations to be able to backpack there. And with the virus, uh, everything was shut down. And then also as everything is opening back up, a lot of people are kind of surging to get into, um, you know, these new campgrounds and going back out again. So I really wanted to find somewhere, you know, that I could just kind of do on a whim. And this looked like a good spot. And I was going to go through Elk Garden to through Mount Rogers to a place called Fox Creek, which is another landmark along the Appalachian Trail. And really why I like this area a lot is because it's it's a lot more of a bald. It's a lot more open. Uh, unfortunately, in Virginia and a lot of the East Coast, since it's a different kind of terrain than the West, everything is a little bit more of like a tree tunnel to where you don't really get too many grand views or summits or wide open areas to fly a drone or kind of grand vistas of shots like you do out west or in Canada or Patagonia or other places like that. On the east coast it's a lot more densely wooded, it's a lot more enclosed and you know it's it's still enjoyable but it's not it doesn't give you that wow factor if that makes sense. But when I first came across southwestern Virginia I uh, I was blown away with just how much it felt like out west and living in Montana a few years back I still feel such a calling to that kind of landscape there's such a I don't know it's a feeling I can't really describe and I feel like I I keep longing for that and to me finding something like that in Virginia has been such a great feeling so I've been trying to kind of find more places like that that I can explore or that would maybe offer some sort of diverse scenery Uh, So I came across that, and it looked to be about a 16-mile end-to-end hike. And I've been trying to find something that I can maybe do somewhat of a loop or a modified loop to where I can go from one end to the other, and then maybe backtrack and double back a different route or something. So I figured, you know, I'll give it a try. I I figured I would do a little bit more long-form hike. Um, And I I was looking through all trails to kind of see. I gave myself three days. And I tried to find a route. I'd never really used the app before, but um, with all trails, the nice thing about the Pro version is that you can download the trail map to your phone. 
And uh, I've, I've gotten a few paper maps before, but they're a little bit tricky sometimes for me to read or understand. Um, and I maybe I'm just like a millennial or something like that, but I feel like there's a certain amount of security, I feel, knowing that I can have my phone, even if it's in airplane mode or has no service, I can check where I am on the route and just make sure, you know, I'm going the right way. I'm still kind of in line with where I need to be, if that makes sense. And I can also just kind of have that handy in my pocket if, if, if I need it, if that makes sense. Um, so I wanted to try that and I could not find the actual route. I could not find the Elk Garden to Fox Creek. Um, and so I wound up just looking it up on Google to see if I could find some sort of similar you know, there's always a little bit of uh, when you are trying to find the, the location or the parking area or, you know, once you get off the interstate, sometimes near those mountain towns, you don't really get too much service. So sometimes I like to just screenshot some directions to kind of see, you know, am I going the right way? How far off from this gas station is this entrance or this and that? Because sometimes the uh, the GPS on your phone the directions to get there don't really match up with how it actually is when you get there. So anyway, uh, on the trail note, I couldn't find that on the app. And so I looked up just Elk Garden to Fox Creek to see if I could find some sort of trail to be able to maybe route that myself. And I found an all trails link on Google, but it was for the reverse. Uh, it was for Fox Creek to Elk Garden. But I figured, you know, I can download this and regardless of it, what direction it is, I can just use this and check where I am on the trail. However, uh, this has been a learning experience. I keep having to kind of remind myself, you know, I'm still I'm still kind of wet. What is the word for that? It's like wet behind the ears, wet behind the ears with this. I've only been doing like three so far. So, you know, every time is a little bit of a learning experience. And I think that I need to learn how to use all trails a little bit better because um, I was trying to just follow a route that somebody else had made. And this person, ah, once I got out there, I could see just how off they were, if that makes sense. I don't know if they did this on horseback or something else, but... The route that I was following was not the most efficient route. Um, it basically started, you technically can start at Elk Garden, and there's a nice parking area. You can park in the field. It's free, and you go through this little gate because there's a lot of cows that kind of nestle or roam across the fields out there, um, and it basically splits as soon as you start as you go through Elk Garden. You can go down the Appalachian Trail, or you can go down the Highlands Horse Trail. And for some reason, the um, the route that I had downloaded said to go down the Horse Trail. And me, just kind of being naive, I was like, well, you know, let me just make sure I'm following the route that I originally planned. So I went down the Horse Trail, and the problem that I would find is that it was so rocky and kind of, it wasn't a very like pedestrian friendly trail, if that makes sense. It, it was a lot more tricky to move through than I thought it would be. Um, but I kept just thinking, you know, I'm going the right way. I'm going the direction that I'm supposed to go. That's on the app. The GPS is telling me. Um, so I just kept going that way. And I, I had assumed before I went there that I would be able to do, you know, I guess it was 16 miles one way. So I was like, you know, I'm giving myself three days. I'm sure I'll be able to do 16 miles one day, 16 miles back the other day. And then maybe that third day I'll do like a quick, like quick up and down hike and then be on my way back. And I grossly underestimated actually how, <laughs> how tough that would be because with this horse trail and I guess also with just the regular trail because once I got off the horse trail I still found how hard it actually was but with the horse trail I think I made it like eight miles maybe eight miles in like nine hours I want to say so almost like maybe maybe a little bit less than nine hours but almost like an a mile an hour and granted, there was a, definitely an elevation change or some cutbacks here and there. I did stop to film. I did stop for, since I have my dog, I stopped for water breaks for him or to eat. But 
gosh, I grossly, like I thought that that would be a breeze. And by the time I got up there at like, you know, 7.30 or 8 at night, I was like, my gosh, I am just exhausted. I'm ready to just put my stuff down, get my tent set up and have dinner. So I think if I were to do another one in that area or surrounding area, I definitely need to learn how to route things um, through all trails myself so that I'm not just being some schmuck following along with somebody else's route. I did about 15 miles overall, and I planned to do about 35. So that didn't go as planned. And there were a few things that kind of threw me for a loop there. I already mentioned the trail that I had downloaded the wrong one. But a couple other things were, um, since I had my dog, you know, he is a great trooper. I'm always impressed because I always bring the carrier for him and I never have to really use it because he's just such a great hiker. I'm always impressed that a pug can just do that kind of distance and fortitude. But I really just don't think that Buddha is cut out for that kind of distance. So, you know, going forward, I'm just going to have to be cognizant of that. The other thing that was kind of a hitch is if I were to continue on that same route and I were to get to Fox Creek, um, there's not an easier way to get back to the original spot. So since it already had taken me like two days essentially to go 15 miles, um, once I get to the end of my trajectory, it's not like I can just kind of double back in a wide loop. I'm going to have to go back the way that I came, at least on the route that I was planning to follow. So that was one of those things I think I would have run out of time. And the last kind of hitch that messed me up is my water filter broke. My little, uh, I think it's like a Sawyer little squeeze bag, the seam that connects the filter to the pouch uh, where you're supposed to squeeze the water through into your bottle that wound up splitting in a few different areas. And I've only used it like three or four times, so quality control kind of sucks. But I think it was like $9, so I guess you can't really ask for that much. But I need to figure out a better filter system uh, because at that point I was completely unable to filter any water. So I was kind of screwed at the second day, I guess like halfway through the day. Um, so those are my four hitches. There was the messed up route, the kind of inefficiency of the route, and also I just kind of underestimated how challenging that would be for myself and Buddha, and the water issue, and then what was the last one? Something like that. So one thing that was special about the horse trail, though, was uh, a couple times when I was walking down it, a group would come by of these horses, and they had these sheep dogs, and I'll show a video here. And it was just so cute to me to see the dogs interact with each other because they were so well behaved. And I always just love seeing kind of free roaming dogs or friendly dogs like that be able to run up and greet each other. And another thing I forgot to mention before is the reason why I chose this area is that it's just filled with these wild ponies. I guess they're feral, uh, but they're very friendly and they're very animal friendly too. They come up to you. They're almost like seagulls and they try to get what food they can from you, or they like to be petted, or they just are kind of curious about what you have going on. So um, I like to kind of just take Buddha there because I'm always curious, like, what do they think about each other? Do they think he's another horse? Does he think that they're big dogs? I like seeing them interact because it's like a pug and ponies. These are two animals that would probably never encounter each other in the wild. So I always just kind of love the meeting of the minds there, but they're always funny the way they interact with you. Sometimes they come up and they'll like nip me on the leg trying to get into my pocket or they'll try to open up my camera bag or this time he was licking my tripod. And both times I've gone to Mount Rogers, there's been some sort of newborn foal or newborn pony that I love to just watch. Um, maybe it's just from watching Planet Earth or something like that, but I just love to see the animals in their habitat, the young, the older, kind of interacting with each other. Um, one thing that's a little bit interesting about this area is that the weather is very spotty. So a lot of times you might look at your weather for that region before you go out there to try to kind of plan your trip. My recording cut off. But anyway, both times that I've gone out there, uh, it said it was going to rain. It says it's going to be raining every single day. But then both times I've gone out, like the day before, 
it completely changes or it'll be somewhat cloudy um, or when I go out, it calls for rain and there's nothing there. So I don't know if that's just inherent of like mountain areas or if that's kind of specific to that one area itself. However, this time around, uh, when I did go out there, uh, the whole second day was just completely pouring. So from pretty much like 10 in the morning until when I got back to the car, which was late afternoon, about like seven or eight miles down, it was just completely pouring the whole way through, um, which, you know, walking through puddles is its own challenge. And since it's kind of higher altitude, you are kind of inside of a cloud as you're hiking. Uh, so that kind of made visibility a little bit limited. Um, and then also just the fact that it's pouring is a little bit of a challenge as well to hike through. Um, but it was interesting. Uh, and I liked you know, it did kind of negate this whole second day of filming, but uh, I came away with enough that I felt like it was kind of a complete story. And with that area, you know, despite the storms, it'll always at least give you some nice clouds for some good light in the evening or the morning, and you'll always have some sort of dynamic. One thing that always kind of catches me is when I look back sometimes at footage or other things like that, how quickly the clouds move in that area. So a lot of times you'll see rain in the distance or if you look back at footage you'll see how quickly kind of the clouds will traverse um, across the sky like I've even looked back sometimes at some footage where I've been walking and you'll see that the the cloud line or the light line will follow me um, in terms of my pace so it's always kind of funny to see how dynamic it is out there too and speaking of dynamic, um, it is funny because both times now I've been out there, one day I'll only see horses and then the next day I'll wake up and I'll go down the same path or in the same area I was, it'll be just completely full of cows and bulls. So I don't really know kind of the dynamic they have between each of them or, you know, how that all works in terms of just one graze and the other follows or what's the deal with that. But it is always funny to just see, like, for example, this past time I went to get water and uh, kind of just have a drink. And I was down just filling everything up for probably like 10, 15 minutes. And I come back to the campsite and like where there were probably a dozen horses. Now there's like a dozen cows and the horses are gone. And it's like, how did they migrate in that quickly? So there's always something new or interesting out there, whether it be a view, weather, animals, um, foliage. Like, uh, I guess summer is maybe a good blooming time, but... I did love to see everything kind of feeling like it was heavy into spring, but also uh, you get a little bit of that fall feel out there too with a lot of the pine kind of openness. So I would say if you go to route this uh, to be able to hike it yourself, probably stick along the Appalachian Trail. That's the easiest to follow. It's very well marked and there are a lot of signs. Um, so going forward, I'll probably do that myself and try to just figure out more efficient ways of doing things. But you can pretty much just follow the Appalachian Trail from the Elk Garden up through Mount Rogers. You can continue to go past Mount Rogers. Um, I've never actually gone to the full summit because it's pretty much enclosed by woods and you just see a sign that says you've reached the summit. You can't really see a big view. The view is more so the way up. Um, so anyway, you can just kind of keep going past through the Appalachian Trail the whole way through, and uh, it's pretty easy to follow. Um, in terms of water, there were, I probably came across four different water so sources on the way through. Um, so there was a few kind of at campgrounds, and then at a few kind of trail intersections as well. And there will be signs that will show you where a spring is. So it's pretty easy to find. I'm always a little bit wary about that kind of stuff, but really around that area and around Virginia in general, you're not gonna go too long of a stretch without actually having a water source. Um, and in terms of sleep too, I did run into a couple issues in terms of last time I had gone to Mount Rogers specifically, it was very easy to find kind of a bald to set up a camp um, on the side of a nice field. Uh, this time it was a little bit more crowded uh, and I think that's just because it was 4th of July and everything was kind of opening back up, but I still was at least to f uh, able to find my own little spot separate from everybody else. But I was a lot more around uh, a group of people. There were probably 
five other f- groups of friends or families that were uh, alongside me. Um, but, you know, you at least still get some space. But I did hear a lot of people going by me in the evening to, like, get water or talk or in the morning or other things like that. But if that doesn't bother you, you should be good. So I wanted to touch on two shots in particular um, when it comes to actually the filming of this. The first one is the shot of the drone footage at the end. Um, So that is something, you know, I I was hoping to bring the drone. That's the other reason I wanted to go to this place is that it's not considered a state park. So drones are allowed along this area. Um, But at the same time, I don't like to bother people. Um, I don't like to bother people that are walking or that are around. So I really try to find areas that I'm kind of isolated and I can just fly the drone. And there are a few times in some of the other drone clips where I kind of waited for people to leave or waited for the path to clear to be able to just take off. But sometimes I would actually wait for like an hour because, um, you know, as soon as I'd go to set up and and take off, somebody would be coming in the distance. And then I would be like, you know, I don't want to mess up their their grand view here because this is the best part of the hike pretty much. So, I would put it back and then sit and wait for them to cross that whole stretch and then get going again and then someone else would come. So uh, I was I had gotten a few clips here and there and, you know, they were OK. Um, but really, the last one, it was one of those things I was coming down the mountain and I was like, you know, this is such a great view. It's right about to rain and nobody else is around. So let me just like set this up and take off really quick. And it looked so cool to me just sitting there um, and looking at the footage and also just experiencing it, like looking at it myself, um, just because there was great cloud movement. There was great kind of spots of light along the mountain and uh, just nice kind of open fields with pine. So I really tried to just fly it kind of high and uh, get a nice cinematic moving forward uh, through the, the scene there. Um, so I wanted to just touch on a little bit of, you know, with some of these shots, just maybe what it was like, and then also what I did. So looking at the raw shot, I shot this in D cine like, and I usually will shoot it to where I'll shoot everything in manual and I will look at, uh, kind of the, the histogram or the exposure value. And I'll try to just make sure that my highlights are not clipped off the end, but I will try to shoot as highly exposed as I can. um, And then just be able to bring that down in post, but just make sure that nothing is kind of pushing past white, if that makes sense in the highlights, if I can help it. Um, Because sometimes some scenes are very high contrast. So you kind of do the best that you can with the situation. Uh, but just grading that from the d like or d style, um, I wanted to just expand out my value range a little bit more. So I did a little bit of a curves adjustment. Um, I lowered the highlights and upped the shadows and kind of the basic panel. Um, increased the overall vibrance. I did do a, a saturation boost in the cyans and blues. And then um, I also, what else did I do? Um, I kind of just worked with a little bit of the color wheels as well in terms of just pushing down a little bit more of the shadows since I clipped the blacks and uh, pushing up a little bit more just to kind of separate out, give it a little bit more contrast just because it's so flat. And I feel like sometimes when you shoot very flat or shoot in a log format, uh, it kind of looks, it takes a little bit of adjustment for your eyes to, um, you know, when you start to expand it from that original native flat footage, it can look more contrasty than it actually is. And then when you look at it, like you take your eyes off of it or look at another clip and look back at that previously edited footage, you realize that even when you were editing it and it looked contrasty, when you look at it again with fresh eyes, it can still look somewhat muted and you still have to kind of expand that out. So even after editing this and posting it, looking back at that video, I probably could have added a little bit more of a tonal range here. I, I still kind of kept it somewhat compressed. It was almost like if, if it was 100 here and zero here, I probably kept it to like 90 and like 10, if that makes sense. I could have pushed it a little bit more. But I did want to emphasize, 
kind of a, a little bit more of a simplistic palette here. So I liked the greens. I liked how lush everything was, the foliage, and also kind of just how blue that sky was with the nice cloud coverage. So I really wanted to push a nice kind of cyan, a nice turquoise, and maybe a nice like dark kind of sea bluish green if that makes sense um so really the, the the colors that i wanted to focus on were like cyan green and then like a sea foam or not sea foam but like a dark bluish green uh so i really tried to put that dark bluish green in the shadows and then boost kind of the cyan of the sky and then add the vibrance of the overall lush green but I actually really liked just kind of the native color of that, and I didn't edit it any more than just what was native, if that makes sense. Um, the other clip I wanted to look at was a camera clip, which was um, something that a couple people had mentioned after they saw the video was the hand on the moss. And with that, I was walking through this path and I came across this log and I love sometimes just finding, you know, you get some grand vistas, but really sometimes finding the more intimate parts of the trail or intimate things that draw your attention, whether it be leaves or the way something kind of catches your eye or certain patterns or simplicity. Uh, sometimes I really just like that as like a nice foil to these big kind of busy, uh, you, know, you know, landscapes. So... I passed this log and it just looked so quaint, like a nice fairy tale with this moss, with these mushrooms, and especially in the forest, it had this very nice kind of lush light. And the moss just looks so cushy and, and very comforting and inviting. So I wanted to just take a nice little moment and just put my hand in it and just focus on how soft and squishy it was. Because, you know, you think about moss and it's very kind of blanket like and it encompasses the whole log but you forget sometimes that it's made up of just individual little leaves or plants so it is funny sometimes to just push your hand down and see them kind of individually come back up and also just drawing attention to those little tiny mushrooms that you know a touch or a flick could just knock them over break them uh, so for that looking at the the uh, raw footage um, it was pretty flat and log, and I really wanted to just make it very green and kind of storybook-like. So I really kind of emphasized a little bit more contrast in the darks and really tried to make it a little bit more warm, but then bring back a little bit more of those cool values in the shadows and the greens. Um, and I probably could have done a little bit more with this in terms of color looking at it sometimes But sometimes I think you know a simplified palette really can kind of make a difference if you think about Painters or landscape painters of old They really had a little bit more of a fixed palette and I feel like sometimes that can add a nice stylistic look to something um, you know when you when you shoot with modern digital cameras there's a lot of a it records all the colors kind of natively or there's a certain there's a certain difference that is separate from what film does film almost will take you know all colors below a certain range or all colors within a certain range and form them into this kind of the shift in let's say for example if you shoot with film and you shoot an ocean or a sky or a sunset or something like that then it'll have a certain stylistic look to it based on how the film i believe reacts with that that hue or that light kind of hitting the film and with a lot of digital media now everything is so kind of precise or kind of uh, sterile or clinical that you lose a little bit of that magic that kind of comes with that. So I've been trying to toy around a little bit more when I shoot with log of kind of staying with a fixed palette and uh, not really having all the colors out. And that's not coming from muting the colors per se or doing a, a selective color or desaturation. It's more so just kind of 
trying to emphasize what's already in the scene, if that makes sense, and drawing attention to kind of the natural colors that draw your eye. So for me, it was kind of the nice greens of the forest, the greens of the mosses, and then a little bit more of the muted red browns of the, uh, the mushrooms, and then kind of having an overall warm glow of the light coming from above. And then the last shot I wanted to kind of draw attention to as well was this shot of coming up and talking to the horse or greeting the horse initially because that was really the first time I feel like that it kind of if we're looking at this as a story it's like the first encounter first kind of shift in the the journey if that makes sense to where there's something else besides just my dog and I and I came across this horse because he was right on the threshold of the the opening of the trail into the woods and I just thought it was so cool to see he's almost like this like forest spirit or something like that. And I thought it would just be a cool shot to just walk up and come upon him and greet him and see how the dog and the horse interact with each other. Um, and, you know, with a lot of these landscapes or, or big vistas or scenic shots, I try to just go as wide as possible just to kind of draw everything in as I can. And especially with a lot of these wide open balds. Uh, on the side of the mountain, I try to just bring in as much as I can of the scenery. And, you know, you don't really want to be shooting a lot of this stuff at, at 50 or anything like that. You really want to get 24 or wider to kind of just pull everything and make the viewer feel like they are looking at that scene as well. Um, but sometimes with a little bit more of these intimate or somewhat storytelling shots, you do want to bring in a little bit more of a, a cold view of 35, 50, 70. And for this instance, I did just have my 24 to 70. Uh, so I wanted to, I think I shot this probably at 35 or 50. And I wanted to kind of have that framing of the, um, the opening of the forest and have really the ferns and the flowers in the bottom and then the trees at the top and there's a nice tree and log that are like on one side and on the other side there's a fence and I just thought that was a nice little framing area of separating kind of the open from the enclosed and there was that horse there that was kind of the the guard at the entrance if that makes sense so I just thought that would be a cool shot of just coming up greeting him and it's a nice contrast as well of the lush greenery of the forests and leaves and ferns with the brown and red brown of the horse uh, so what I did here was also um, a little bit different I added in a uh, a mask at the bottom to kind of just darken down that uh, that fern and flower area just to be able to bring in a little bit more of drawing the eye up to where I want the eye to be focused on if that makes sense and you know with a lot of landscape or nature video you can't get everything right you can have to make do with what you have but at least having sometimes flexibility to be able to say you know this was a little too bright but we're gonna pull that back down and make that a little bit more subtle to be able to just push the vision where we want it to be because you know if you get your composition right if you get your subject right you have sometimes good freedom uh, within editing depending on how you shoot or what your your camera is to be able to just adjust that last little bit the the tones or the values to be able to kind of just pull the eye right in that direction that you want and make it very subtle so I wanted to just add that in and uh, really just kind of make it nicely framed and somewhat centered but also have that that rule of thirds in there so that the horse was not direct center so I think it came out pretty cool I did like that shot that was that was a nice little unique moment that it came together like that so uh, really that's that's all I really wanted to touch on I figure I've rambled enough but just talking about the journey the area kind of my experience and going forward maybe what to look out for um, and then also just the the video itself. So I hope you enjoy and um, I'll get better at these figuring it out. I kind of did want to make it somewhat of a one take, but I'll probably try to make it a little bit more concise going forward. So I will see you on the next one.